So Richard Gardner is a lifelong resident of Golden who grew up learning about its history. He has a master's in history from the University of Colorado at Denver and was the first person who was professionally certified by the University in Historic Preservation. We're talking about that very exciting program and agreed to be a pioneer in that as well. He's a member of the Jefferson County Historical Commission and sits on its landmark and preservation committees. Richard is also a historian and past president of the Golden Landmarks Association. He's worked to save and preserve historic golden landmarks and artifacts, and has recently released the 2011 Historic Golden Calendar, hopefully he'll tell us more about that too, which has many historic golden dates, uh, pictures, and information within that. And currently he's working on a map which shows Golden's historical neighborhoods and place names, and hopefully will be available by the holidays. So we'll turn it over to Mr. Gardner. Ah, thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, talk to you about this uh, subject. It's a uh, kind that I don't often uh, get to do. It's an important element of Golden's uh, recent past. And as a historian, I uh, don't believe in time limits. I believe that if you can objectively prove it's important, it's important. Doesn't matter what age it is. It could be from a thousand years ago. Important history can happen today. And uh, sometimes does. You hope it's for the better. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, what I'm here to talk to you about today is uh, what I sometimes uh, like to call uh, Golden's other famous porcelain. Uh, the Coors porcelain uh, is uh, well known and uh, internationally famed. And so were these that you uh, see around me here. Uh, these are the uh, art decanters, which were made uh, by Foss. The uh, ski country decanters, which were produced by the uh, Foss folks from 1972 through the 1990s. Collector art decanters have existed for over half a century since uh, Jim Bean pioneered them back in 1955. And uh, for years, making them was a dream of uh, Frank Harrison, who was the vice president of Foss and uh, manager of the Foss Liquor Department, which actually <laughs> keeps uh, sticking around today. It's uh, the Foss Building Wine and Spirits now. Uh, when Foss was thinking of a way to introduce the public to its uh, house bourbon label uh, ski country, there finally came an opportunity for Frank. Uh, and seeing also to commemorate the coming 1976 uh, Winter Olympics to Colorado, ski country produced its uh, first decanters, which were fillable porcelain sculptures of three skiers, which were blue, red, and gold. You can see two of the skiers uh, right there at the end of the table there. There's the blue and the red ones and up in the uh, display case over here is the gold. When Colorado voters rejected the Olympics, uh, <laughs> production of the decanter was already underway. Uh, so uh, folks decided to just go ahead and market them anyway, see what happens. Uh, then Ski Country created a second issue, which was this guy here, the beautiful bald eagle. They called it the Majestic Eagle. and. Uh, this is what truly got Foss uh, launched in the collector bottle business. And it also marked the advent of Ski Country's renown for attention to uh, detail and realism and superior craftsmanship in uh, what it did. From there on, Foss produced 195 decanter design productions over some 25 years of subjects ranging from wildlife to Indians to Christmas to birds of prey to waterfowl and more. Because of their high quality, uh, Ski Country became known as the Tiffany of the decanter industry. To create these decanters, uh, Ski Country began by using original artwork of their subjects, which were most often uh, uh, paintings, often done by local artists. And these uh, artists uh, included uh, Donald Malik, Kent Pendleton, uh, Robert Katona, who I believe was the son of another gifted artist here, uh, Verna. And this is uh, Robert's design here, the Peregrine Falcon. And also Rob Proctor, Sherry Passarelli, Barbara Foss, who was the wife of Foss's uh, <laughs> proprietor, Heine. And uh, you'll hear more about her in a bit. <laughs> Uh, Dick Miller, Ralph Oberg, Glenda Farnham, and Dennis Goldacre. From uh, the artworks, the process uh, went into translating their designs 
into three-dimensional sculptural decanter form. Ski Country's foremost decanter producer was uh, Godo and Company Limited of Nagoya, Japan, which uh, Nagoya is a suburb of Sido City and uh, was known as the porcelain center of Japan. Uh, they, they didn't try the Coors porcelain, uh, I uh, believe, because uh, Coors porcelain uh, is exclusively scientific, and these are uh, art uh, for domestic use, and uh, I imagine uh, that's the reason why. But Goto was uh, recognized globally for outstanding ceramic craftsmanship as well as uh, scientific and industrial quality uh, ceramic goods. As of 1984, uh, while Ski Country was in production, Goto had four factories in Nagoya covering 426,000 square feet of floor space with 18 kilns of various types, 13 press machines and five automatic casting machines, with the company employing 500 highly skilled ceramic workers. Over half of them were women. And the company was established in 1913, which happens to be the same year the Foss name made its advent here in Golden. Nearly uh, all ski country designs made by Goto were sculpture, uh, sculpted by Akiro Kato, a specialist in wildlife art decanters. From translating them to three-dimensional form, Goto then made uh, prototypes of the decanters, which uh, one could use to make design changes from posture and design elements to fine-tuning to create the finished product ready to produce. And around me here are a number of the original uh, mock-ups. And you can tell one of these mock-ups from the uh, production pieces in several ways. The production pieces usually have a stamp on the bottom indicating their year and subject. And uh, this is a production piece and you can see the normal stamp that it has there. But the artist proof do not have those. They often have uh, factory labels from Goto or another producer on them, or handwriting notation, or they can be completely blank, though some early production pieces also had blank bases, so it's not an absolute thing. Uh, Mock-ups can have uh, different coloration and positioning, too, indicating they're an earlier prototype that has since been adjusted. And uh, I'll show you here one of the mock-up labels from a Barber Foss uh, design. That's the Goto label there on the bottom, along with uh, one of the mysterious uh, pieces of handwriting, which is a Roman numeral, which I think <laughs> indicates the number of attempts. Uh, Barber Foss's designs uh, took a lot of fine tuning because she wanted, uh, especially uh, like the Indians, to be authentic. Yeah, to make and distribute and sell these decanters, uh, one uh, during this process needs to check several factors while you're in the prototype stage uh, beyond just the marketability of the subject. Uh, you need quality. They need to look realistic, lifelike, and very well done. They can't be sloppy. And Ski Country had such high standards, they even destroyed an entire production run, which uh, was the Woodland Trio Christmas decanter because of what they termed inferior workmanship. However, uh, not quite all of them got destroyed. Uh, there's a crate of them that survived. <laughs> Here's one of the little guys now. <laughs> Does he look so inferior to you? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think they're a little hard on themselves. <laughs> I think these guys are cute. Uh, and uh, glad to have uh, gotten a hold of a little of the contraband. <laughs> and another factor you need to look at and uh, quite seriously consider is breakage. With intricate designs featuring uh, lifelike subjects, uh, Ski Country continually pushed the limit as to uh, what decanters could be physically created well, at the same time, being able to ship them nationally and even internationally. But with uh, delicate components like outstretched wings and arms, the potential for them breaking off while in transit uh, multiplies. And you, 
need to make production decisions as to how much is an acceptable risk and how much is too great a risk. And uh, you see here, the butterflies, they're a beautiful subject. They would be able to sell quite well, but they are so delicate that they would never survive uh, being shipped anywhere. And so this is the only one that I know of that was uh, made of those. And uh, others, uh, the, the uh, fish are also delicate, uh, but uh, what I believe the main problem with these fish and the snow leopard here was, was that they're top heavy. So if a uh, customer had them on their shelves or whatnot, they could tip over too easy. And uh, that can be a problem as well. And uh, the uh, Jura Falcon there, you can see it has a number of outstretched delicate components and whatnot. And that, that one can uh, be a, a, a bit of a problem too. Uh, though I uh, would note that uh, a couple of these they did make uh, into production pieces. They just uh, did them in different form later on. They never uh, gave up on their subject. Uh, they adjusted uh, both the quality and the breakage uh, factors using the prototypes. The mock-ups were used uh, to uh, fine-tune the uh, colors, uh, such as uh, with uh, Barbara Foss's uh, Indians, uh, to make turquoise and other colors the most authentic. And uh, here you see three mock-ups of the uh, basket dancer. And uh, though at first glance they all look alike, they're not alike. There are, are actually very subtle changes between them, uh, like one's the uh, positioning of uh, the lady's arm, and uh, another is the shades of the turquoise. They also adjusted colors to make them more lifelike. And uh, over here, these two big ones uh, at the end here, th that's the uh, gallon size screech owl family. Uh, the one on the left is the production piece, and the one on the right is the original mock-up. And uh, the production piece is meant to make them uh, look more realistic, I'm sure, but, but I like the mock-up because it looks spookier. It's, it's great to put on display at Halloween. Uh, now that one uh, is colored like uh, the earlier release of uh, two smaller sizes of the Screech Owl family before. So you can see how in a couple years uh, design had advanced in uh, coloration. Yeah, they adjusted uh, posture to lessen uh, break and p breakage potential, and uh, sometimes they made major changes to make them a more marketable uh, work of art, like uh, one with more major uh, is the uh, bobcat up here. The mock-up is the one on the uh, left, and uh, the production piece is the one on the right. And for uh, whatever reasons, they felt that changing the uh, tree to uh, stone was uh, something that uh, folks might like better. Some of the mock-ups were just uh, plain and simply experiments, like uh, this black bear family, which uh, this is the only one that I know of, which is a bit of a shame because the cubs look nice and playful there. But uh, uh, this is one of the uh, little experiments they uh, did and uh, took me down to the basement of us to show me and ask if I wanted it. Uh, it was very nice of them. Yeah, when a decanter design was complete to satisfaction, uh, Ski Country then pulled the trigger, trigger to pu put the design into production. And uh, one of those, for instance, would be this one here. The uh, gallon-sized uh, bald eagle family, that is called the Birth of Freedom. And that uh, is actually uh, the mock-up of the most valuable production piece. Uh, people uh, really seem to like that one, though it's uh, almost indistinguishable from the uh, production piece. The uh, Ski Country decanters were always released in a limited edition. The lowest uh, number was 120 of the gold skier there. That was the one they made the fewest of. And uh, biggest was uh, 12,000 of the uh, 750 uh, milliliter uh, widgeon uh, duck. 